really talk about corruption and my question does GEO is most of these people invest the money and they keep it in the West <coughs> Switzerland and some other countries and for years for years and years GEO is continued and it's still continued so is the West somehow not helping these people because they can't keep the billions of US dollars in Africa there's no way you can keep it so are they not helping these dictators by keeping them in power I think you have uh, that, that sorry yes uh, the question was to what extent uh, the West has been a, a accomplice of uh, of African uh, rulers uh, who have embezzled funds uh, because they were able to put them to Western bank accounts uh, over the past decades I think that there are two parts of an answer the first part is uh, certainly there has been uh, there have been the wrong motives uh, within Western governments, I would say, up to the end of, uh, of the Cold War. Uh, because supporting Mobutu uh, for the uh, uh, Americans and Europeans uh, was certainly immoral, but it was done uh, uh, in order to prevent uh, the Soviet Union from getting to the riches of Katanga. So uh, uh, there was a very strong reason for that, economically speaking, um, but it brought down the Congo in the end. Uh, even more than it was already. So, uh, yes, the, the West uh, has done a lot of wrong, and we have very often worked with the wrong people. But uh, over the past 15 years, I think this has changed very much, and the reaction of those who embezzle funds has been to take that money to Dubai, to Singapore, uh, to places uh, where Western sanctions uh, could, not, uh, 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 could not be in, in the way of using uh, those funds. Uh, and uh, Europe has long lost the monopoly for Africa to be uh, the, point, the, the, the focal point for education, uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, investing money, uh, and for doing trade. Um, Africans are turning very much to, towards Asia, and in the Middle East, uh, uh, you know that there, is, there are many safe havens for, uh, for ill-acquired funds. Yeah? What will be the impact of uh, AIDS, HIV, on this optimistic picture you give of the future of Africa? And number two, how is the AIDS epidemic being dealt with, especially in South Africa? The, I would say the main uh, economic and uh, social problem of AIDS now is, I'm not talking about the medical side, now is um, the high rate of uh, mortality of 30 to 50 year old highly productive um, individuals uh, in societies that, uh, that are on the move and, and would like to improve economically speaking. If you have uh, someone who is qualified and he, he goes at 35, uh, it was economically speaking the wrong investment. And if that happens in large numbers, uh, this brings down uh, your growth rate considerably. I'm only talking, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, saying this in economic terms now. Um, it has, of course, uh, uh, a devastating social impact. You all know about the, uh, the child-led families and about uh, the role of grandparents in, in uh, looking after children uh, because the parents uh, uh, are not there anymore. Um, it has been, I'm saying it has been uh, an enormous problem for Southern Africa in particular, let's say up to, up to the DRC. Um, to a lesser extent in East Africa and, and, uh, and in West Africa, but mainly to Southern Africa uh, over the past 10 or 15 years. Now, they have all died, and the, the new infection rates are much lower, so that uh, this phenomenon will not repeat itself with the same amplitude. It will certainly continue to be a factor, but to a lesser extent. Um, South Africa has been a special case in as much as uh, President Mbeki uh, for uh, reasons that are difficult to understand for, for Westerners, because he's a very educated person, um, was uh, uh, in the denial faction and had a minister of health uh, who said that eating beetroots would cure you from AIDS. Now, this, is, uh, uh, this reminds me of these very strange um, uh, ideas and, and uh, myths that are prevailing uh, among many simple people in Africa that uh, you can cure yourself from AIDS if you if you violate a young girl. 
uh, because this will go away then. Uh, this is uh, in, in spheres that uh, none of us can understand, but it's there. So um, the, the cure from AIDS uh, through beetroots uh, is now over in South Africa. With Beki gone, uh, the, the new uh, government, the, the Zuma regime, is facing these things uh, and uh, does not um, uh, pose obstacles to all those who are combating AIDS anymore, as uh, the Beki regime did. But they certainly have a responsibility to answer to for their uh, rather silly uh, politics in, 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 this, uh, in this respect. Thank you very much for coming and speaking today on Africa. I have some I have a question about the slave trade, which is very prevalent in, in the West and the central part of Africa. Um, reading the reports from UNESCO, it seems to be increasing. What, did, what can be done about that? Education, education, education. That is, that's the long-term answer. Um, the phenomena, phenomenon is, uh, uh, is important. Uh, it is not a game-changer right now. It's, it's not in proportions that uh, I would say uh, would, would justify headlines every day, but it is serious. And it's especially the child trade uh, between uh, the poorer parts of the Sahel zone from there to the, to the southern coastal uh, areas of West Africa, uh, where you have uh, uh, a higher um, economic uh, uh, level and, and uh, uh, more jobs and, and uh, more modernism. So uh, I think what you're referring to is, is the trade of children to work in households uh, in the coastal cities uh, who are being taken away from their very often illiterate families uh, in the Sahel zone further north. Uh, that has been a problem for all West African countries for some time, and I think there is an international response uh, through United Nations and, and NGOs um, to come to the, the root causes of the problem. But my, my uh, fundamental experience from uh, seven years in Africa is, is uh, unless you educate, unless you educate girls in particular, uh, you will neither bring down birth rates nor uh, those ancient habits of uh, thinking of children as a commodity. Uh, please remember that uh, uh, when the Americas were built, this was uh, very much at the basis of, uh, of the thinking of West African kings who worked in collusion uh, with the European slavers. So uh, th these things, uh, while they were, they've gone out of our minds in the 19th century, uh, are still prevailing in, uh, in the more remote societies of uh, internal Africa, not coastal Africa. And um, uh, the, the work of uh, United Nations and NGOs, and also of some of the now more modern and enlightened governments there, and uh, uh, places like, uh, like Ghana and, uh, 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 and Benin have modern governments, uh, are doing a lot to, uh, to, uh, to bring that down. Uh, but we are not there yet, you're right. Yeah. Well, last question. Yeah. The, the, the background to my question is I work with a number of companies and recommend their expansion overseas. In the past few years, the only place in Africa that I recommended to my clients is to go to South Africa. So my question is kind of two part. One is, if you look around Sub-Saharan Africa, in addition to the countries you mentioned, are there one or two what you come I might call rising stars or the most hopeful places? And the second part is, do you think Zimbabwe could be one of those if Mugabe were to pass away? Uh, yes, in, in, in both cases. Uh, Zimbabwe is, is a place where I would put some money today if I had some to spare, uh, uh, because I, will, uh, I, I would uh, predict that the moment he is gone, uh, everybody will rush, and it's always better to be there a little earlier. The conditions, especially in terms of infrastructure and education of the Zimbabwean middle class, uh, are quite exceptional for Africa. The level of literacy and of, uh, uh, of, of beyond ground school, uh, basic school education in Zimbabwe is the highest in sub-Saharan Africa um, and comparable to Tunisia for the Arab Africa, for the northern Africa. Um, uh, the difference being that uh, uh, Tunisians made a revolution because the young educated people could go nowhere, uh, 
there's no South Africa next door, and Europe was closed for Arab immigration. So uh, the water was boiling uh, and overcooking from within. Uh, in Zimbabwe, they voted with their feet. They just went away. And three million Zimbabweans, and very often the best educated, have left the country, but are waiting for opportunities to go back. So an investment in Zimbabwe, uh, including uh, the reservoir of the diaspora, um, uh, and there are mechanisms, I think, to find the right people, uh, is uh, for the, uh, uh, the risk-oriented uh, uh, people. It's not for the faint-hearted. No, nothing is for the faint-hearted in Africa. It's not for sissies, as they say. Uh, and uh, I would see a, a midterm, a very good midterm risk in Zimbabwe. In West Africa, uh, Ghana is certainly uh, the first uh, nation to mention. They, uh, they have the best indicators in many ways. Uh, they survive a presidential election, uh, which is won by one of the two contenders with 50 and a half percent against 49 and a half percent, they survive that without bloodshed. That is unique in Africa. You would not have that elsewhere. So uh, uh, Ghana is really in, in many ways, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the vanguard of, of West Africa. Um, and uh, uh, of course, it is, it is easier for American investment to go to uh, Anglophone Africa than to go to Francophone Africa. Uh, otherwise, uh, one might also look for uh, opportunities now in, in Ivory Coast, in Cote d'Ivoire, or in Benin, but then you would need more uh, language and cultural uh, knowledge than you would need in, in Ghana, which is an easy country to, to get at. So th those would be my two main recommendations. Thank you so much to Ambassador Thompson.